My name is Jenny Minto. I'm the manager of the Museum of Isla Life. The museum turned 40 last year um, and is situated in a former Free Church of Scotland in the very picturesque village of Port Charlotte on the island of Isla. The museum is run by a group of trustees and we've got three part-time employees who work um, really from April through to October and if we're lucky to gain funding we also can keep two people employed part-time through the winter months as well. So the collection is very wide-ranging. Um, it's been built up over the years and even now barely a week goes by without us getting something new. The vast majority of our collection are, are items donated by local people or people with a connection to the island. Um, they range from um, spinning wheels, to clocks, to dresses, to implements, to archaeology, to f items found on shipwrecks. So really wide-ranging, I say to visitors that it's a bit of a treasure trove. Uh, what we try to do is, with our objects, is try and tell the personal story around them as well, because we think that's what really captures people's uh, imagination in the museum. And we also try to be very open in the museum to allow people to really get close up to the objects, so not everything is behind a glass panel. Um, we also, um, we also concentrate on certain stories around the island. So currently we have been having major commemorations for World War I on Isla. Uh, in 1918, two British troop ships carrying American troops were lost off the, coasts, the coast of Isla. The first one, the Tuscania, was on the 5th of February 1918 and it was torpedoed by a German U-boat. The second, the Otranto, uh, collided with another vessel in its convoy in October 1918. And both these tragedies um, resulted in um, over 600, probably over 700 bodies being washed up onto Isla's shores, um, but, and also uh, some survivors. The survivors were looked after by the local people, brought in uh, to their homes, and looked after um, in a very hum humanity, humanitarian way. And those that sadly didn't survive were looked after, the bodies were looked after and um, uh, recorded um, in the, by the, the local policeman, Sergeant Malcolm McNeil, in his notebook, just so for easy identification. And then the uh, the bodies were then um, respectfully buried uh, in a number of temporary graveyards on the island. Um, it must have been a, 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 a horrendous time for people on the island to experience um, all these bodies being, being washed up, but the way that the community pulled together and worked closely with uh, the American Red Cross is a really powerful story and World War 100 Scotland felt that, agreed with that and we had a major commemoration in May this year um, which was attended by Princess Anne, her husband Sir Tim Lawrence uh, and also the American ambassador to the UK as well as uh, diplomats representing France and Germany and members of the, the UK and Scottish government. Uh, it was a, a truly amazing day. Um, the whole community uh, got involved in various guises, which was just amazing. And one thing we're really pleased that happened, uh, especially for a, a small local museum like the Museum of Isla Life, 
um, is that we managed to get a really important and precious uh, artefact from 100 years ago um, into the museum and we currently have it on display. Um, 100 years ago at the funerals for the Tuscania victims it was felt by the islanders that the men deserved a proper military um, burial and there wasn't a Stars and Stripes on Isla at the time. So uh, the joiner of Isla Estates, uh, they found a, a picture of the Stars and Stripes in an encyclopedia and the joiner scaled it up to about six by three and then the flag was sewn by four women who worked for Isla Estates. They started at four o'clock in the afternoon and finished at two o'clock uh, that the following morning in time for the first of the Tuscania funerals and this flag was flown at each of the funerals. Um, in May 1918 the flag was gifted to President Woodrow Wilson of America and he then subsequently gifted it to the Smithsonian Institute and um, we started dialogue with the Smithsonian um, about 18 months prior to the commemorations in May and I'm pleased to say that on the 3rd of May, uh, the sorry, the 2nd of May, the, the flag arrived on Isla and we now have it on display in the museum for this year of commemoration. Um, for a small museum to achieve something like that has been pretty remarkable and we are very, very thankful to the Smithsonian for understanding the story of what happened 100 years ago on Isla and the importance of the flag coming home for this year. Um, also around the flag we've created um, a, a display of artefacts that we have from both ships, um, that's the Tuscania and the Otranto, and also various objects um, that the museum held before, including um, a wonderful uh, lithograph of the American monument which was built on Isla. Um, in memory of the loss of both um, both ships and I'm really pleased as well that um, through suggestions led by the museum and also World War 100 Isla that the American Monument has now been listed by Historic Environment Scotland. So for us to have relationships with these larger organisations across Scotland has, has been a real benefit and will continue to be a benefit for the museum. Um, we also, because we're an accredited museum through Museums Gallery Scotland and the Arts Council, we uh, were able to get some funding which allowed us to create a, a display telling the story of some of the Isla men who went to World War I. Um, and just having that space and knowing that we had the funding to cover the staff meant that we were able to spend more time thinking about how we wanted to represent uh, these men and also how we could best use the objects that we have. As I said earlier, we, we rely on donations. So what, what we have in the museum is what we have to work with to create the various displays. And we try and concentrate on topics that we've got a lot of objects about that can illustrate how, how people lived. Um, on the island and what they did when they were off the island as well. So the World War I display, I think, um, has really, really highlighted um, the importance of actually the thinking space to be able to create um, these, these displays for specific anniversaries. Um, we've also, we're also very lucky in that we've got a large collection of uh, archaeological um, pieces which have been found on Isla over the years. Uh, life began on Isla, we say on our literature 10,000 years ago, but just last week, um, at the beginning of August, we uh, received into our custody uh, a worked flint that's actually 11,500 years old. It was found uh, in a dig four or five years ago on Isla and um, because it was found beneath two layers or between two layers of ash from uh, eruptions or from a volcano in 
Iceland, the archaeologists were able to specifically date it. So we now have that um, worked flint as part of our collection. So we go from the Mesolithic period, we've also got um, items from the Neolithic people, so from hunter-gatherers to the first farmers. Um, we've got uh, objects that have been found in chambered cairns, um, and we also have uh, objects from the Bronze Age. In fact, um, quite often we get people coming in having found shards of pottery in various locations around Isla um, that we can add to our collection of bronze pots. But again, um, I, I, quite often, I, I will say to visitors, I will say to visitors that actually people were coming to Isla long before whiskey was ever um, made on this island. So Isla has a very, very rich history and um, I'm really pleased that the museum is working closely with Isla Heritage who are doing a number of digs um, on, on Isla, um, exploring the, the prehistory and actually now are currently doing a, a dig at Dunavig Castle just beside Lagavulin which is bringing in um, medieval history as well and being in partnership with them means that we will hopefully, when they hopefully find objects uh, on that dig, that we will be able to tell the story of these objects and, and the dig. So really adding more to the, the wealth um, that Isla has. Um, I mentioned whisky. Uh, one of our um, prize objects is an illicit still, which was found somewhere near Bally Grant and that's all I know um, because people were very careful about where they placed their illicit stills when um, whisky became uh, a taxable commodity in 1824. Uh, so our illicit still is very popular with um, visitors that come to Isla to to sample all the various whiskies that are made on this island. In fact, um, some people pay their entrance fee, walk up to the illicit still, get their photograph taken beside it and then leave. Um, some do that and spot another object and stay much longer, but um, it's, I think it's really important that we're able to show that element of Isla's um, culture. Um, we, we also have a number of implements um, that have been used on Isla. We, um, we have a, a set of tools which were uh, owned and worked with by the saddler uh, in Port Charlotte. Um, they had originally been donated to the museum in East Kilbride, the National Museum of Rural in East Kilbride. Uh, and the family who donated them there got in touch and discovered that actually they weren't on display there and felt it would be wonderful if they could come back home and displayed in, in our own museum. Um, so we're really pleased that that was able to happen and we now have a display and it's great as well because we discovered that some of the horse leathers that we have in the museum's collection already were actually made by that saddler because they have uh, his emblem on which is a very simple fish. So we were really pleased that we can link, um, link an object we already had with new objects as well. Um, I said earlier that telling the story of people is really important and um, many of us believe that um, it's difficult to go to any corner of the world without meeting someone that has a connection to Isla. Um, people's, the first major um, emigration of people from Isla was in 1738, um, when, and that, the that was the first of three ships that headed uh, west to the New York colony. And on one of these ships was uh, a young boy of five called Alexander MacDougall. Well, Alexander uh, became quite prolific in America. He rose to the heights of Major General and at his funeral, George Washington described him as one of the five pillars of American independence. He, was also, he also created um, or established uh, the um, National Bank of America. So it's, it's important to be able to show that for a small island, a lot of our 
population actually went away and, and did great things. And one of the things that we like to be able to do is help people that are coming back to Isla, um, maybe tracing their families. We get a lot of people from America and Canada and some from Australia and New Zealand and actually mainland Scotland as well that are coming to, to trace their family roots. And although we don't specifically do genealogy, we do feel that we can give people a sense of place um, and a connection with where their, where their families originated. Mm -hmm.